Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, apparently the books have already sold out. Uh, so, but there is more at Penny University. So if you're interested in a copy of the book, uh, Annabelle at the front is the person to speak with and we'll get you on a list. I believe she has more at the store. Um, yeah, so don't, don't fret. You can't hear me? All right. Then you have to be quieter. <laughs> it's going to get ugly here in a second. Thank you. Okay. Do I need to use a city councilor voice? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, it really is an honor to be here. I am kind of blown away by how many people showed up and expressed interest in, in the subject. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with members of the community as well as colleagues to talk about the edited book collection that I had the privilege of putting together with friends and colleagues, uh, Sean Tucker and Emily Eaton from the University of Regina. And we have an incredible cast of contributors to the book, which uh, you'll have a chance to meet some of them later in the evening. On Friday morning, bright and early, Sean Tucker and I had the privilege of being interviewed on CBC by uh, Stephanie Langenator here in Regina about, you know, why did we put this book together? And really it started as a chance to tell the story of co-op refinery lockout from a community and labor perspective. So that's kind of, that was the interest. And uh, from there, we started to dig a bit deeper into the role of governments in advancing the interests of businesses over that of workers. So that's a central theme here. And also what we started to discover, and you'll see this in uh, some of the chapters, and how the media does or does not cover the nuances of disputes about environmental regulations, about the impact of industry on community well-being, and about the importance of protecting pensions. And that's actually a central feature of, of tonight and the issues that we're wrestling with. And another reason is that we wanted to take a Regina-based event and think about its relevance outside of the city, outside of the province, for other jurisdictions that are producing the way we are, fossil fuels. And so we're trying to tell this story, and that story is in part being told in the book by the workers themselves, to an international audience. And I think there's something here that's worth talking about elsewhere in the country and internationally. And I think we did have our first international sale, a colleague at the Adam Smith School of Business. <laughs> In, in Glasgow, actually, I, th I think she purchased the book because the conversation that we're having is happening with oil workers in the North Sea, in Norway and elsewhere. And so I think it's really important to link what happened here in a very small uh, prairie city with what's going on in, in larger centers in, in countries around uh, the world. And another inspiration for the book was uh, the theme of a contribution by Steve Early, who is a labor journalist, and he wrote a book called Refinery Town. And I think you know where I'm going to go with this. And it was a really about the political and economic influence of refineries located in the Bay region of the United States on the West Coast. And not surprisingly, it's a book about how industry calls the shots with money and cultural influence, and how it dominates city councils, how it dominates the economic terrain, how it dominates how it funds the arts, and, and actually just defines the world around it. And I think you can see how that might work here in Saskatchewan as well. Another observation that we had working through this was something that we started talking about as the convenient oil worker. And you know them. They show up at rallies, and many for good cause, concerned about their own economic well-being. Uh, they show up at pipeline rallies. They hate Justin Trudeau and the Liberals because of his environmental policies. And they wear I Heart oil and gas t-shirts. And they participate in convoys. 
And these oil workers are loved by conservative elected officials in the industry because they create a very nice, neat little package of who's extracting wealth from the ground and creating value and wealth for particular communities. So it's a very convenient story. But what about the workers who are freezing on picket lines? And what about the workers who are fighting against concessions being forced upon them by an employer that's making record profits? And what about the workers that get arrested for fighting for these bargain benefits? Where are the oil-loving politicians <laughs> when that happens? Where is the selfie with Andrew Scheer and Pierre Polyevra at gate seven? <laughs> so for me, the lockout really demonstrates how thin that I heart oil and gas story really is when workers who are actually working in the industry are asking for help. And instead, they get an FCL leader who dismisses the constitutional right to bargain, or sorry, to, to strike and to picket. They get helicopters and they get bomb threats. So that's a big theme in, in the book. And for those of you interested in all of these different themes, I encourage you to pick up a copy when one's available. Uh, Kevin Skerritt, who's here tonight, is an expert on pensions, and I think he really does form a cornerstone of this book. I think if you have a day-to-day -day material interest in this issue, he does a terrific job in providing an analysis of pension politics and how the pension plan featured pretty heavily at the heart of this historic dispute. Uh, chapter three is probably my favorite because it's a chapter that is exclusively the voices of some of the workers who were either retired or employed at the time who walked those picket lines and had an incredible story to tell about what it meant for them. And we'll hear a little bit more about that tonight. And they don't just talk about labor rights, they talk about just transition. And they provide a very important perspective on what does the future hold for the industry. And it's very different than what the elected officials in the industry is trying to have you believe about what oil workers are saying. And they're talking critically about the relationship between unions, the employer and the state and governments, about workers' rights and about environmental policy. Uh, Charles Smith, who's here tonight as well with uh, Lisa Wanlin, dug into class power and the limits of the right to strike demonstrated by the criminalization of workers and their union when they were engaging in forms of civil disobedience on the picket lines and taking it actually elsewhere in the country to raise awareness about what's going on. Uh, and with Caitlin Schroep and Julia Peterson, Trish Elliott, who's also here this evening, a very renowned journalist in her own right, union activist, uh, and soon to be retired academic from First Nations University, crafted an exceptionally well-written chapter on the community impact of the co-op refinery complex since the facility's establishment decades ago. And we only have to think about uh, the news coverage about how did they get a small city built on the outskirts of a refinery during this dispute? <laughs> and how did they get away with pumping carcinogens and other substances into the water system that damaged public property? How is it that that's possible? And it's a beautiful chapter called Ungovernable, how a refinery became too big to fail and what it means to the people of Saskatchewan. And Sean Tucker here this evening as well. Uh, he is well known for his research and writing on occupational health and safety. And he talks about a long standing research engagement with this question of uh, the co-op refinery. And a lot of engagement with workers themselves and the imminent dangers to property workers in the community at one of Regina's most important workplaces. Uh, Doug Nesbitt and Emily Leedham, who couldn't be here this evening, addressed the death of the labor beat reporter in chapter seven. And I think it's, it's an incredible story. Uh, if you think about how thin most of the coverage is of labor rights, of strikes, and specifically of this particular struggle, it took a long time for reporters to clue in to the, the delicacy of what's going on. 
and often in the early stages would just take a press release from the employer and run with that as, as fact. And so it took a long time and it's really about the gutting of an entire industry and how important journalism is and the labor beat reporting uh, stream was to understanding the complexities of these issues. And then finally, Emily Eden concludes by unpacking the concept of just transition. If you look at the title on just transition, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and what this means for refinery workers here in Regina, but also for workers in communities that are dependent upon fossil fuels elsewhere in the world. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone off to Sean and Emily, and then we're going to dig into a panel of former and current uh, workers at the refinery, and then uh, Trish has some remarks to make, and then we're just going to open it up to questions and answers about any of the issues that you might have about tonight's event and the book itself. There you go. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Sean Tucker. I teach and research occupational health and safety at the University of Regina. Uh, it's welcome uh, tonight. Thanks for coming. It's great to see uh, so many familiar faces coming together in one room. Uh, I'm just going to be really brief here. Uh, why we wrote the book, Andrew's kind of already covered that ground there, so I won't uh, dwell on that. Um, one thing I, I would say, and I said this on the radio the other morning, is that uh, one thing we need, and it's, it's an ask of, of people in the room, is a community, community liaison uh, committee with the co-op refinery. Uh, this exists in other uh, refineries, uh, the uh, Parkland Refinery in Burnaby, um, and come by chance, Newfoundland, they had a uh, community liaison committee. And essentially what that does is a f it's a table for discussions about community safety. And, and we don't have that right now. Uh, unplanned ad admissions, admissions at the plant, other things, um, you know, it, it's, time has come. And so if there's people in the room with different backgrounds that are interested in that, uh, you know, maybe talk to Andrew, maybe the city can, can do something to put that together and maybe the refiner would be amenable to that as well. Uh, thanks again for coming everybody. I'm going to turn it over to Emily now. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thanks so much for coming tonight. It's kind of overwhelming to see everybody here. Uh, lots of people that um, I know and like and love and uh, more people that I'd like to know better. Uh, so it was a really a great honor to be part of this book project. Um, and especially to have the chance, as you will tonight, to speak with and hear from uh, members of Local 594 about their experiences during the really punishing lockout um, and about their understandings of the future of their industry. And my interest in this project um, came because, uh, or it stems really from a background that I have researching the fossil fuel industry in Saskatchewan and studying uh, movements for energy transition. So. Um, from about 2012 to 2020, my research took me to oil producing communities throughout the province, where I had the opportunity to talk with a lot of oil workers, uh, farmers and ranchers who had wells on their lands, regulators of the industry and community members in these areas who were living uh, with oil and, and asking them what that meant uh, to them. So, but in these, this journey, almost all of the workers that I spoke with were non-unionized because, of course, uh, the industry out in the patch is uh, predominantly non-unionized in Saskatchewan. So it was really a great pleasure to be able to work with uh, union members here. I've spent some time studying movements advocating for energy transition, as I said, um, and I've seen the discourse that this province, uh, in this province that really vilifies these movements um, and any government policy really meant to address climate change. So it's my firm belief that for the climate movement to win, we need a mass movement. And if we have a mass movement, that necessarily means that the working class has to be part of it. So we need workers of all kinds um, to target the culprits of climate change, the companies that are producing the pollution and making profits off of that pollution. Workers are best positioned to understand this and to lead movements that target the industries and the producers responsible. Um, so it's my belief again that fossil fuel companies are in a fight for their very survival, that they're making plans they have no intention necessarily of keeping, promising that they'll bring their emissions down significantly or to net zero um, through some fantastical and expensive technologies like carbon capture. 
um, and that they will use their transition promises to extract what they can from workers and governments. And we saw this um, in the uh, lockout and the fight between the workers uh, and the company in this case. Um, so the CRC really tied its bargaining position of lowering workers' pensions to the savings that they were asked um, to make or that they were required to make for the low carbon transition. And that was something I really picked up on in the messaging um, that the CRC uh, was putting out into the media and that I thought was really underappreciated and under uh, picked up on by all aspects of like Saskatchewan media, of the union itself. Um, and so I, that was what I was digging into sort of in, in my chapter. Um, I'll conclude by saying that just as the FCL and the broader fossil fuel industry are positioning themselves to address federal regulations that require reductions in carbon emissions, so too should fossil fuel workers. By not addressing the CRC's rhetoric of energy transition, the union local will concede an important arena of labor and political struggle and potentially miss strategic opportunities to communicate with the public, engage the government, and stand up for workers' interests in an economy that is already undergoing significant changes. So I think what we are seeing is that energy transition, sorry, transition, is simply too powerful of a terrain and a narrative for fossil fuel workers to concede to their bosses. Um, and that's sort of you know one of the overarching uh, arguments we try to bring forward in the, both the introduction and the conclusion. So thanks again. Uh, it was really a privilege to work with all of you fine folks and to see some of you here in Regina tonight. Um, and I look forward to what everyone has to say. Thanks. The, the reason we're here is to talk about the, the workers' perspective. So I know we have three very esteemed guests who are here prepared to talk about these issues. I'm not sure if you all wanted to come up at the same time, but we have Kevin Bittman, who during the dispute was president of Local 594, Dan Josephson, uh, a retired member uh, from the co-op refinery complex, and Nathan Kramer, who is the current president of 594. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say this evening. I'll allow you to fight amongst yourselves to figure out who comes up first. Good, the retiree, so this is great. The, the, the gloves are coming off. He doesn't care what he has to say. I'm looking forward to this one. Thank you. I wanted to start by saying uh, thank you to Sean and Andrew and Emily for writing this book. It was something that really needed to come out. Um, it's, it's a perspective that was never going to be heard through the media. Not a chance. So. Thank you to all of you uh, for doing this, and thank you to everybody for coming. Uh, I'm so honored to be able to speak tonight. Um, so, as you heard, my name is Dan Josephson. I worked at the refinery for 38 years. Uh, I retired in 2019. I spent about 28 years of that time on the executive in one form or another. Uh, I was on the bargaining committee from uh, about 2001 to 2017 and I went through five rounds of bargaining with the refinery. So tonight I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the history of bargaining there from when I got on and till I left. Um, so um, my first round of bargaining really was in 2004 and that was a very long and large uh, bargaining round. Uh, we were coming off of a six-year deal at that point in time. Uh, in 1998, we made a pension improvement, a fantastic pension improvement for ourselves. We went up to a 2% formula. Um, so that was a, a very large uh, bargain and with a, a very good Im improvement. Um, but we didn't get to address everything because in that six-year deal, of course, the refinery had no interest in talking or solving any of the problems we had in that six years. So 2004 was a very large bargaining uh, round. Uh, 2007 was the next round that we were in. And uh, we were able to make another, uh, again, a very large bargaining proposals. Uh, we made another good move in the pension plan. Uh, we got up to 75% indexing, which was, uh, as anyone who understands pensions, 
That's a, that is so necessary. If you're, if you're sitting on a pension plan for 30 years uh, of retirement with no indexing, that's like not getting a raise for 30 years. It's, it sounds great when you retire, but 30 years down the road, you're barely getting by. So indexing is absolutely crucial in a pension plan. So uh, 2007, we got that pension improvement. We also managed uh, significant improvements in other benefits and in wages. Uh, one of the benefits was a, a trial program on a parental leave. Uh, that, was a, that was a massive new thing for our industry at this point in time. Uh, we were able to get 26 weeks of parental leave, unheard of in our industry, but it was a trial period. Um, in 2010, now 2007, 2004, we took strike votes, but we didn't use them. 2010, uh, was significant in my mind because we were able to come to a deal without taking a strike vote. We didn't make any strive to make any improvements on the pension plan. We were happy with what we had. But the benefit plans, uh, specifically the parental leave, had ended and we were able to get it back. We got it back at, at 16 weeks. We didn't get the 26. We had to give them something and that's, it was fair but 16 weeks for, for everybody. And that was a, a major, major plus for both the men and the women in our local. Uh, management included. Management was able to utilize this as well. I've had a number of uh, engineers come to me and say, thank you guys so much for getting this parental leave plan that we can take advantage of. It's, it's awesome, it was incredible. So that was about the end of when things were really good. <laughs> in 2013, well, that was when things turned for the worse. Uh, we had just started bargaining, and the refinery manager was allowed to retire. Allowed to retire. Uh, that was right at the start of bargaining and that was the start of the downturn in the relationship between the union and the company. Uh, bargaining was very difficult in 2013. It was protracted. We ended up using the services of a mediator before we were able to get a resolution. Um, the company was putting a lot of pressure on wanting to reduce the pension plan. They said they, they had to do something about it and I remember sitting at the bargain table and asking them, are you saying you can't afford it? And the answer was, no, we just don't like it. So that, that's kind of the mentality that you were dealing with at the time. It's, they can afford it, they just don't like it. And you gotta remember, this is a company for whom profits, I think in the 38 years I was there, there was maybe two years where every year wasn't a record profit. Uh, by the time, by the time the lockout was coming out, they were making almost a billion, billion dollars a year in profit. Not in sales, in profit. I mean, you, you think about that, that's, it just blows your mind away when you compare it to the budget of the city of Regina. <laughs> now, what could you do with a billion dollars? So, uh, at this point in time, uh, the management structure at the refinery changed. Um, Saskatoon is the owner, Federated Cooperatives is the owner of the refinery, and up until this time, refinery managers have been able to keep Saskatoon basically at bay and keep them out and, and run their own show. 2013, once the refinery manager left, Saskatoon got their fingers in there and they changed everything. They changed their management structure. They went from a small team to a large refinery leadership team. Most of them had no idea what the hell they were doing. Uh, that's in my opinion, but um, really at that point in time, there was an explosion of grievances, uh, problems, reinterpretations of the collective agreement, reinterpretations of language that we would both agreed on for years. Suddenly, apparently, meant something completely different. And, you know, they were just astounded that we 
you know, hadn't picked up on this for some reason. Um, there was, uh, that was also the time that uh, the refinery expanded to their new offices on Park Street. And that was another whole uh, fiasco. Um, when they moved many of the jobs and the office jobs over to Park Street, they decided to inform us that those workers were no longer part of our local and that those jobs were gone. Well, we disagreed, as you can imagine, uh, took them to the Labour Board and the very conservative Labour Board agreed completely with our position and basically gave them a bit of a spanking for what they said and what they did and we got all our jobs back. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, again, we used a mediator in 2013 to settle. Between 2000, 2013 and 2016, again, times were very difficult. Um, they went through a plethora of HR people. None would stay very long uh, because it was a, a nightmare of a place for them to work as well. Uh, they weren't allowed to settle grievances. Um, they had one, one HR person was hired in, uh, uh, quite a good lady, um, I respected her. Uh, she was hired in early on in that, in a very senior position, but she made a mistake. She solved two grievances. <laughs> and shortly after that, she was laid off and they decided they didn't need her anymore. This was, this was the, the environment that they were in. They were fostering uh, they were fostering anger, they were fostering hatred, they were fostering trouble. They couldn't and wouldn't solve anything because they didn't want to. They wanted, they wanted to set up a strike. So 2016 came along again, the next round of bargaining, and that was extremely difficult, the worst bargaining experience I've ever had in the five rounds. Um, Essentially, the company didn't want to agree to anything. If you said black, they said white. If you said blue, they said yellow. It was, they could not and would not agree on a thing, and that was their whole strategy, was to agree on nothing. Um, about halfway through the bargaining period, they started building their lockout camp. Now, nothing says we want a deal like building a lockout camp. But they did. Um, we did take a strike vote that year, and we got, I think, the strongest strike vote I have ever seen. We were 97, 98%. Uh, it was, we've never seen one that strong, but the people, the membership, were behind the bargaining committee, and they were ready to fight. And that's something that we took very seriously. But we were sitting in a really difficult position. Because even though our membership was ready to go walk out and fight for this, fight for the pension, because they were coming after our pension, we knew we were in a position where we would be walking a picket line for people who don't even work there yet. And our membership was behind us and ready to go, but our concern was how long would they stay out? And as you saw in 2019, it was a long lockout. So, Mediation in that bargaining failed and uh, with the help of the National Union afterwards, we were able to come to an agreement and it was one that was the hardest agreement I've ever had because we took, we took a, a step back on the bench and that hurt, that hurt. We closed off the pension plan to new hires. So it was essentially the future death of the pension, of our DB pension plan. But we had the promise from the company that with this agreement, they were done with the pension. It was saved, it was solid. They'd never have to touch it again. Well, they fucking lied. They did, they did. Yeah. 
So we, uh, we came to that tentative agreement and we took a ratification vote. And uh, that ratification vote, the membership understood the, the bargaining committee's position and ratified it. Uh, there was a lot of questions, but that's, that's fair, there should be. The company, however, was shocked that we ratified that vote. When I called the HR manager after the vote to tell them it had ratified, she couldn't believe it. She was shocked. They were certain we were going to turn it down and they were gleeful in the idea that they were going to be able to lock us out. That was their mentality. They wanted that lockout so bad they could taste it. And they said afterwards that they were angry at the union because they figured we'd bamboozled them. Because we, we didn't fall into their plan and get locked out. Wonderful people, wonderful people. Um, really from, from 2013 to 2019, ongoing massive turnovers in the HR, um, increases in grievances, uh, they radically increased the number of management staff. Uh, this was all in preparation for locking out the workers so that they could try to run the plant themselves. Um, and it wasn't just the union people that they were treating like garbage. Their own supervisors, the frontline supervisors, were treated like garbage too. Uh, it's amazing that they were able to get people to take the jobs and keep them. A lot of them were tied in, they were long-term employees, too old to go somewhere else, tied to a pension plan that got taken away from them against their will. But this is the refinery and they'll look after you. Um, really, this was a, a toxic atmosphere. As far as the relationship goes, I'm not gonna talk about, you know, the air atmosphere. <laughs> um, it marked a time of very poor relations with the company. Um, I was able to retire before the lockout hit. I thank God I did. It probably would have killed me had I been there. Uh, I don't think I could have taken the stress. And uh, that's all I'm going to talk about in the, in the bargaining history now. I'm going to uh, ask Kevin Bittman to uh, come up. He was a refinery uh, local president at the time of the lockout. So. Thank you very much. The positive part of the, the talk? Yeah, this is the positive part. I'm going to talk about the lockout. So. <laughs> so thanks for coming, and thanks for having me, and thank you, Dan, for that. Um, Dan is somebody that, you know, I grew up in the labor movement with Dan. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 594 and the mentorship that we had within our executive. And he was crucial to that in my career. So I'd, always, I'd also like to thank the authors of this book because like Dan said, you know, points in history sometimes don't get told. And I think it's crucial um, for something like this um, because people will forget and this book will put it down in history. And, you know, I, a lot of our members don't like to talk about the lockout because it was a stressful point. I take every opportunity, so I'm going to take it here and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. You know, when I first started getting involved in the labor movement, it was at the co-op. I didn't know much about unions before that, um, but it was very clear, very quick, that 594 was a different union. And uh, they had a great membership, but it was because they had a great executive that worked together and a great mentorship program. And Dan is just one of many that when I was a young 23 year old starting at the co-op, if you wanted to get involved, they were there to help you. And it was, we had no paid positions. So it was, it was an environment where we learned from each other and we all pitched in to get the job done. We understood that the relationship between the company and the union was very important. And we understood that the companies needed to make money if the workers were gonna make money. And working for an oil refinery, like Dan said, we did really good for a lot of years. We were a family, and the workers and the company both understood that that family worked together to keep that refinery running and profitable. And I would say that our local was a terrible union because we blurred lines everywhere to keep that refinery running. 
And lots of unions, building trades, hated us. But it worked for us, and it worked within our plant. And our members appreciated what we were doing because it worked for everybody. But then there was a shift, and Dan talked a little bit about it, and Dan shied away from using names, I noticed, <laughs> but I'm not going to. So, Bud Van Heiderstein, you know, he was the guy that kept Saskatoon at bay. And he would joke when we sat at the bargaining table when Saskatoon wasn't in there, before, you know, after a caucus, and he'd come in there first, and he says, Saskatoon's not here, let's get the deal done, right? So he understood it that changed, but he understood there was a mutual respect and a mutual relationship that put me mega money in the coffers of FCL. And he had a right-hand person, and that was Gil Ladresse. And Gil was sitting at those bargaining tables and he hated it. He hated that there was a relationship that worked. And when Bud got pushed out, Gil was taking over and he hated the union. The company moved from a mutual respect relationship to one of a parent and child relationship. So the company was the parent, you're the child, you'll do as you're told. Now don't get me wrong, I fully understand who owned the co-op. I fully understood who my bosses were. But when their mutual respect isn't there for the workers, we have a problem. Human resources, like Dan talked about, became a revolving door and all of a sudden the workers were human capital and they were the asset ma management team. You know what the interesting part was leading up to the lockout and the changes? Is the workers never wavered. The workers knew what their jobs were, did them better than ever, and never complained. They knew the company was going in the wrong direction. They knew they were mismanaging the company. They knew it was costing profits, profits but they also knew that they didn't own the co-op and that was not their decision to make. A little naivety, I guess, but they felt that as long as they did their job well, they'd be looked after. I always, I always, you know, I sit at a lot of bargaining tables and the right to manage always comes up, right? And, and we always talk about companies own the company, they have the right to manage, and I always say they always have the right to mismanage too, and the, and the co-op was really good at that. Now I know the book, a lot of the book is about pensions and wages, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna shock you a little bit here because the media made it out about pension and wages, but the workers knew exactly what this was about. And Dan touched on it a little bit about the three years prior. This was not about wages and pension. This was about breaking the union and the workers in that union. And the media never once not once did they ever report on the fact that there was never even an offer on the table for the members to vote on. Yeah. They wanted to make it about pension, and every time I stood in front of the media and said, we didn't have a choice, they locked us out, they reported about pension and benefits. They had one motive, and that was to start that refinery back up with the workers with no union. So when you read this book, Unjust Transition is a perfect title. Here we had a co-op, and we always like to call the co-op a company. Guess what, they're not a company, right? This was formed by the people for the people, right? And here you have a co-op using a greener, a transition to a greener economy for a reason to take away pension and benefits, or to take away the union that they wanted to belong to. Nobody cared, nobody reported that the reason the pension was in shortfall was the interest rates were at zero. We tried at the bargaining table to say, look, if the interest rates are at zero, of course you're gonna be underfunded. But when the interest rates go up, you're gonna be okay. Guess what? The co-op refinery right now is taking pension holidays because the interest rates are up. Social media, the lobby, Big Energy has done a masterful job of convincing workers that we need to stay in fossil fuels. The workers are some of the loudest voices, and Emily talked about it, were some of the loudest voices to stay in fossil energy. But guess what? 
Companies are transitioning and moving to greener economies, greener, greener solutions. You know what the only thing that's not going to be looked after? Is us, the workers. The transition is going to happen, and what's going to happen is it's going to be from good, high-paying jobs with benefits to the lowest possible that they can get away with. These companies have never lost profit, and they don't plan on losing profit. The only thing that they're planning is to leave the workers behind. During the lockout, the media helped the company peddle this narrative that the workers had to lose to get ready for this greener economy. The police, we talked about the bomb threat. When could you possibly have a bomb threat against union executives and a picket line, and the police don't tell anybody about it? When I would travel to the picket lines, it took minutes when I stopped at a picket line for the police to show up and tell me to leave. Let's ask ourselves this question. What was the co-op really willing to do in the name of transition? And I'm gonna walk you through what went on, really what went on at the lockout. We talked about it. They built a scab camp on city property leased by the city, sorry Andrew, <laughs> that housed over a thousand workers. They forced scabs and management to live in that camp during a global pandemic. Public campaign against workers, the same workers that made three million dollars a day for that company. They tried everything to divide the public by putting billboards up that were outright lies. And now we see that same thing happening by our frickin' government. Yes. Yeah. They made personal attacks on me to try and make me the villain, but they didn't realize that I was locked out right with my colleagues. They tried to drive a wedge between the workers and the union executive, but they forgot that we were locked out as well. They had somebody following me around for seven months. Everywhere I went, my tail went. They intimidated my wife. They're in our backyards in the middle of the night making noises. We caught people peering in our windows on several occasions of our house. They parked a car outside of my house when I flew to Calgary for the first day of mediation with Vince Reddy to intimidate my wife. They, when I put cameras up in my backyard, the next morning, my tires were flat in my car. Security tried to bait us into altercations on the picket line. They put dead animals on people's doorsteps when spouses got too active on social media. When members were in the park playing with their kids, they had thugs taking pictures of us to try and intimidate the workers. False flag operations to paint us as thugs now you tell me, does that sound like a company willing to take their workers into a transition? <laughs> now I was lucky enough to get out, but there's lots of people that didn't, and they have to rely on the co-op for their career. There's a lot of people that ask, is climate change real? Do we really need to transition? And I'm not here to debate those answers because that's what the company wants us to do. Because if we're fighting to find out those answers, we're not in the conversation about how we move forward. Companies have convinced workers that, you know what, you need to fight for us. But guess what, they're not willing to fight for you. We cannot forget what happened here. Because the companies only care about one thing, and that's money. So don't ever think that they care about the workers. Companies are planning for the future. They are. The conversations are happening. The only difference is we're not part of them. We need to be part of that conversation to ensure that when we transition, the workers, the wages, and the benefits go with it. They're banking that our heads will be in the sand, and we'll be out there fighting to keep fossil fuels around, Meanwhile, they have every intention of leaving us behind during the transition. The lockout has taught me one thing, and this is probably the most important thing for any worker. 
The co-op refinery spent probably $400 million to try and get rid of our union. And guess what? They didn't have an answer for it. And that was us. We stood together. We never lost one person on that picket line. Everybody went back in there. They didn't have enough money to try and break 594. And that's why today, Nathan Kramer is the president of 594, still representing workers at the refinery. And when we stick together, the possibilities are endless, not only for present workers, but our kids and our kids' as kids. So thank you, and I'll call on Nathan to give you a kind of post lockout. Thank you. thank you so much. Yeah. All right, yeah. Um, I'll start off first by um, also thanking Emily, Emily, Sean, Andrew for putting this together and as well thanks for the invite here tonight. Um, happy to be able to speak. Um, you're right, a couple of tough acts to follow. I'm, I'm <laughs> not as fond of the mic as those two are but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, get th I'll get through what I've got here. Um, I've actually followed them both before. Um, I've been at the refinery, sorry, Nathan Kramer, um, current president at 594. Um, I've been at the refinery since April 19th, uh, 2007. Uh, it slowly became more active in the local and uh, the first uh, difficult act to follow was actually Dan's. Um, I, after the prior negotiations that he, they both spoke about, um, I replaced Dan as negotiating chair. Um, luckily for me and, and the whole local, Dan was always there answering questions, mentoring, and still is to today. So thank you very much, Dan. Um, later on, followed Kevin um, as president of 594. Same story there. Kevin's still there. We talk frequently, nearly daily. Um, <laughs> he's. He's still uh, bailing me out all the time. Um, so I'm here more to talk about uh, post lockout. So I've also only got like four years to work with where they had like 20 or 30. So that's a bit of my excuse for being a little bit more brief. But um, <laughs> I'm also here to uh, try and talk a bit more about the positives. Um, if you know me, that's, that's just in my nature. I'm a super positive, optimistic fellow all the time. Um, so th there's been a complete change out uh, in, the, in the RLT, the refinery leadership team, since the lockout. Um, that's definitely a good thing, I think. Um, maybe can't say the same about FCL, um, though they haven't seemed to be that, that involved since, but that could just be a between contracts thing. Um, yeah, um, the, the CEO that was there during the lockout, uh, he is gone. Um, he's the CFL's problem now. Um, <laughs> but th the replacement, his, his replacement um, was around during the lockout and in the lead up to it. Uh, whether or not there's an improvement there, yet to be seen, but if I'm being honest, I'm not holding my breath. Um, so, but just to keep talking about the refinery and about Local 594, um, the new RLT, the current RLT, um, they're much more open, at least so far, um, to communication and uh, resolving issues early before they become big issues. Um, Sorry, changed my phone orientation and lost my spot here. Um, so the, they've got more presence on, on, the, on the floor, in the workshops, in the, in the control rooms. Um, they do a, a walk every Wednesday where they'll pick a new section and come through and you know there's an opportunity for face-to-face -face with the people on the ground floor, with the leadership. Yeah, we all groan about it when it happens, like, ah, it's, it's a Wodge Walk Wednesday. 
the new process director's name is Waj. Um, <laughs> but we appreciate it as well. People, pre people like being heard and feeling involved. I think that's, that's a step forward. We never saw Gilbert unless it was for <laughs> not great reasons, right? So um, that's good. They've got more of an open door policy um, for anyone, not just the union executive. Lots of people have you know, asked to have a chat with them, and they're open to it, and that's good. Um, twice a year, the union exec has a, it's kind of like a joint company union management meeting, um, but it's with the actual RLT, not the typical lower level people that can't necessarily answer questions or agree to things. Um, we just had our second one a couple of months ago, and it's good, they, get, they give us the opportunity, and, and us, them, um, to be more honest and, and candid in some of the things we bring up and discuss, and we've had some good discussions, um, some difficult discussions, but necessary ones. Um, it, it's all progress, I think. Um, this is all, all new, and I don't think it's ever happened before. Um, grievances, there's always gonna be grievances. Um, but we're working through new grievances a lot more quickly. Like I had said, um, we can get ahead of a lot of them before they need to go to an arbitration. Um, we're working through an accelerated grievance backlog project to get through the 150 or so wow. backlogged grievances we had going into it. And a ton of them did get knocked off the list. We're entering the second phase of that process now, which involves mediation, and I think there's around 40 in there, so pretty good. Um, <laughs> an improvement, anyways. Um, so for the first time in a long time, I, I asked Kevin, he thinks it was maybe around 2009 or 10, the last time they asked if you'd say some words at their Christmas party. Um, last year was the first year they invited us back for that. Um, we're doing more things jointly with the employer. Uh, we've done a Movember fundraiser for a few years now with them, and the company matches what was raised. Um, prior to that, we did it as a local, but with no involvement with the, with the employer. Um, they actually asked us a couple of weeks ago um, to join them in the Pride Parade this year. We did actually decline that because we'd already committed to doing it like we have in previous years with the other Regina Unifor locals. Um, the company's comms committee worked with our comms committee um, to replace that uh, faded working together sign <laughs> that I think maybe Abe helped had something to do with the first time. but. We kind of threw that at them a little bit. Um, so that's replaced, that's new. Um, and the 2024 turnaround that we're in right now, um, is the first year and also I would say close to 10 years that they've utilized 594 members from other areas of the plant like process and the lab, PDD, to come and help turn wrenches with some of the tradespeople. Um, rather than just some additional contractors. Um, so all steps forward and I hope it sticks. Um, there's lots of good things happening, lots of improvement, um, even if it can be slow. Um, they're saying and doing the right things to rebuild the relationship, mend fences. Um, but with that said, we've also told them that um, the people, the membership will not ever totally be confident that, that we've patched things up and that things are going to be okay going forward until we go through another negotiation with no scab camp, no games, no, yes. no any of the things that we've seen for the last couple of rounds of negotiations. Um, so we'll see. But for now, I'm cautiously optimistic um, about the future, about the next round of negotiations. Um, about the membership, um, membership's still strong. There's more engagement than ever. Uh, I'd say it peaked around the lockout um, and it really hasn't tapered off. Um, 
That's something that came out of the lockout that never went away. Um, the communications we've set up, chats and email lists and stuff, um, those are still there and they keep everyone informed and engaged and up to date. Uh, and yeah, really I, I, I frequently say, I used to say it more because I know it bothered them, but it's true. The lockout was the biggest team building event in 594 history. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was a difficult time, but a few good things came out of it. And of those few good things, the biggest would be the solidarity and the sense of community amongst the membership. Um, and it's still riding that high point today. Um, all we can do is, is look, look forward, see where we're at, and uh, hopefully things keep improving. I've, like I said, optimistic for the future and for the next round of negotiations in 2026 here. So we'll see where, where we're at. Again, thank you very much. Nathan, thank you so much. Uh, so our next speaker who's going to offer a few remarks is Trish Elliott. Uh, in addition to being a, an accomplished academic, uh, Trish is an exceptional journalist. And her chapter is the clearest, the most concise, and the easiest to read for every audience. The it's the longest, too. OK. I'm trying to flatter you here, Trish. Like, just take it. <laughs> uh, She's covered this issue uh, for quite some time, and her work has been, been very impactful when it comes to changing public policy. Trish Elliott, thank you very much for joining us tonight. You know how the mic works. Yeah, my hair. I think it's okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I said I didn't want to talk, and then they put me on the agenda anyways, so I guess they thought I had something to say. So I composed some notes. Um, so I was really happy to con be able to contribute to this book because I'd been kind of watching the refinery for a long time. And I needed somewhere for all that data and research to go. Um, there had been some CBC reports on, on refinery emissions uh, back in 2015. And so I was curious, had it improved? I was not surprised to see it hadn't really. Um, <clears throat> because the chapter of my book is ungovernable, meaning like no level of government is able to step up and, and actually regulate this refinery the way it needs to be regulated to protect the citizens and the workers inside it. Um, <clears throat> so one of the themes in my book is secrecy, and you would think that annual environmental reports would be something you would put on your website that anyone could look at, but no, you have to have a freedom of information request and hours of delays. I had two great students, uh, Julia Peterson and Caitlin Schropp, help me with the, the FOI request. And they come back with partial redactions. Um, and then there's the major hazards report that's sealed up in a box in the courthouse after a journalist tried to get at it. <laughs> so journalists aren't all bad, right? We, we, we do what we can. Um, so the, the upshot is we live without a lot of information that we need as citizens uh, here in Regina. Um, I'm going to give you a few numbers. Bear with me, because I think they're numbers that every citizen and worker, well, the workers already know, but every citizen should know. Um, no refinery leaks as much as this one in Canada, um, and that's not the fault of the workers who are in there trying to work in that situation. Um, this is not Canada's biggest refinery, yet in 2021, it alone was responsible for nearly half of all the fugitive emissions in Canada out of one refinery. Yes, 48%. Um, and it, over the um, past decade, responsible for 36% of VOC emissions. Um, so that's one of the most prevalent factors in air, air pollution related cancers. Um, and over half of those have been fugitive emissions. Again, these are the results of faulty equipment, um, accidents, things like that. We all heard about the vin vanadium uh, going into the um, water system, into the sewage. 
Um, and this, uh, and you know, most the vast majority of refineries don't put any vanadium into municipal sewage. Um, never mind tons of it. Uh, <laughs> So the city finally stood up and took them to court. Um, and um, the following year, the co-op got it out of the wastewater. They got it down to 290 kilos. But that same year, I looked into the stats for Airborne, and vanadium going up the stack uh, rose 25%. Um, so EPCOR's multi-million dollar P3 plant was protected. Um, and it was us citizens and the workers who were exposed more to this risk. And it is a particularly, it's actually more dangerous once it's airborne, because it binds to particulate matter and it travels a long way that way. Um, you can read all about that in the book. Um, so, um, Sean had mentioned what is happening in, in uh, Burnaby, is it? Um, and so in terms of Regina, well, let's look at what's happening in, in Chemical Valley in Sarnia and in Anjouanong First Nation. There are 10 continuously operating air monitors embedded in neighborhoods. You can go on a public website and see what the air quality is. Um, <clears throat> here in Regina, we've got a couple of, according to the information I was able to dig out, frequently malfunctioning fence line monitors inside, in the, at the refinery and nothing in our neighborhoods. And the, the Great Plains, Arizona is not equipped or empowered to monitor refinery emissions um, or to monitor what's going on in neighborhoods. Um, for alerts, we have Notify Now, which is a phone app uh, that relies on the co-op itself to register an air hazard. It has never done so. It has never done so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, not even, during the lockout, there was 1.1 tons of sulfur dioxide accidentally released. No alarm, no warning to citizens, despite um, obvious health hazards. And in terms of transition, this pattern of industry self-policing suggests that any alternative fuel options they get into, it's also going to be lightly governed in terms of, of safety um, <coughs> and um, air emissions. So I came away from, oh, and then they, they, the big thing is, you know, they're sending stuff to Weyburn. They're sequestering, sending to Weyburn. Weyburn's facility is, is leaky as well. Um, they've had some massive leaks there. One night, out of one valve, they lost 200 million liters of CO2. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and they use it to, like, pump more oil out of the ground. Um, so I came away from my research feeling we need to have the same protections as places like Sarnia, and why not? We live closer to the refinery than they are, and ours is leakier. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope citizens can coalesce around that as well. Um, you know, like I said, the, the governments are like backed into the corner. Oh, it's a major employer. We can't do anything, but, but we need safe jobs and we need safe homes and communities. Um, so normally as a journalist, um, if I wanted to know what's going on in Uplands, I'd go door to door and just knock on doors and talk to people. But this research happened during the pandemic. So I put on a thing on social media, anyone know anyone in Uplands? And a friend of a friend of a friend said, oh, there's this guy James, you can maybe talk to him. Um, at first, he didn't really want to talk about it like openly. Um, James Whittingham, who's, who um, graciously agreed to be in the book, um, he was a little worried at first. He had a relative working in the refinery. We all know how this province works. Um, so um, I, I really thank him for speaking out. And uh, since that time, uh, he has since become more of a, a clean energy warrior. He's got a podcast, The Clean Energy Show. And I'd like to invite, speaking from the perspective of a resident and a neighbor of the refinery, I'll invite up James. Hi, everybody. I was sitting at the back all night, so I'm going to talk loud for those people back there. Um, I've been there for 15 years now, but I want to give you some background. I'm a shit disturber. I've always been a shit disturber. 
I have some things in, in common with the refinery workers here tonight. In 1986, I was a hapless 20-year-old working at a Shell food store. And somebody came around from the UFCW and said, hey, I want to organize. And God damn it, did I organize. <laughs> we almost won. <laughs> if it wasn't for the idiots that I worked with who were more hapless than me, we'd be unionized across the nation. So yeah, I worked at the second busiest Shell food store. We went crazy, we did crazy things there. I got fired there eventually. And uh, I got a big package from, uh, from, from uh, unemployment insurance because I had organized a union. And I was a, a member of the UFCW. Uh, I, I worked for them for a while. Uh, Cadillacs would drive by me on a street at midnight and say, hey, get in. And I did. And we went off to Buddy Steak Ranch and uh, talked union stuff. And um, the other thing I have in common with you is I've breathed a lot of bad air. And I'm probably going to die because that's how I feel. I, uh, the reason I didn't want to move to Uplands, I had friends who were there when I was a teenager. I went there, I couldn't stand the smell in the 80s. I never wanted to go to Uplands, I never wanted to visit Uplands. I sure as hell didn't want to live there. And I, in, the, in the 2000s, I had a dream of owning a passive solar house. I decided that clean tech was so cool, uh, it was something that I aspired to. So I was looking in Regina for a house that I could renovate into a passive solar house, but that house had to be on a street that goes east and west. All the streets in Regina go north and south, so they're hard to find. And I was searching on MLS and MLS, and then finally I forgot to put on my filter to not be in Uplands, and it showed me a house in Uplands that was actually a passive solar house. It was already a passive solar house, and because it was right next door to the pipeline, it was worthless. So I could afford it. My background is in comedy and in film and television, and I've never had a pension, I never will, and I couldn't afford, I've always lived beyond my means, so this was one way of living beyond my means. Um, and it worked out terrific. Like, I highly recommend a passive solar house. Most of the glazing is on the south side. It's minus 40, the furnace does not come on. The house is bathed in sunlight because we live in Saskatchewan. And you are cheerful, you are happy, and I can look at the bunnies running along the pipeline. <laughs> I can listen to the pipeline plane fly overhead at low altitude, seeing if there's any leaks. And I can talk to the Enbridge workers who come to my door to say, I can't dig a hole in my backyard because it was a surveyor error, the surveyor error, and I'm actually closer to the pipeline than we think we were. <laughs> but my, I raised my kids there on that goddamn pipeline. We used it. We, we I mowed the fucker. I, I put down, uh, I kicked out a few gophers, and we put down a, a badminton court every year. My kids learned how to play softball there. They learned how to fly kites there. Uh, they learned how to ride bikes there because it's soft. It's better than pavement. And uh, although they resent that to this day. so. We had a very good experience there. I have no regrets. Uh, it's a weird place to live. Um, we have a, a four, we have a boulevard on one side and an empty field on the other and some trees. So you overlook with all the south glazing of a large area and a playground and a, a park. And it's, uh, I don't hate it, but because I live in a passive solar house, my house gets warm all the time. I like fresh air. And it's well insulated. The wall's very thick, thicker than me. And I need to open my bedroom window at night to let air in. I love the fresh air. And I off-gas a bit myself. So it's nice to have a little bit of uh, fresh air come in the house. But what happens is the refinery, if, I'm, if there's an east-southeast wind, that specific wind, I will get it. So if I'm driving the kids home from school and we go across the Broad Street Bridge, 
we will sometimes hit the refinery air like a wall, like a brick wall. It'll just hit us. And sometimes I'll go to bed, the air is fresh, I'll wake up and I'm breathing this stuff and I'm probably not going to live very long because of that and for other reasons too I won't get into. But yeah, it's, I don't, my kids have neurological disorders. You have to read um, Vas, um, Patricia's uh, chapter five of the book. It reads like a horror story. It's the best horror book I've ever read. Congratulations on the book. It's very well done and um, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I go to bed now. I'm a little more concerned when, when Trish asked me if I uh, ate my vegetables. So I'm wondering what the hell that's about. Um, should I be eating my vegetables? Should you be eating your vegetables? A lot of people on social media come to me and they say, uh, well, Uplands is bad. You know, I know somebody who had cancer in Uplands. But I've looked at what studies there are. There aren't a lot. But I've seen uh, maybe two or three studies from the United States, mostly focused on Texas refineries. The cancer rates are up within a 10 mile radius of the refineries, okay? You all live within 10 miles of that refinery. So don't think that you're off because you don't live in uplands. I'm not the, the sacred guy who's dying up here. You're all dying too. And that, inclu that includes our bedroom communities, okay? So that includes White City and, uh, you know, Belgone, all those places, Pilot Butte. Um, you're all occasionally downwind. When the wind stops blowing, it just flattens out and, and like a mushroom and just comes right out. So when the wind stops blowing, that's when I get it. And uh, I'm not happy about it. I'm angry about it. I want more information. I'm mad that um, there's not more information. I want to ask the authors more information. Uh, I have a, approximately a thousand questions. Um, I have a podcast called The Clean Energy Show. I drive electric vehicles. I'm done with fossil fuels. I breathe them only. I don't use them. <laughs> so, if any of the authors would like to come on the podcast, we were number three last week in our category. Uh, there's only 2.5 million podcasts in the world, so don't let that affect you. Don't let that uh, impress you. Um, Stephanie Langenator, down here, us, tens of thousands more, okay? <laughs> so come on our show, I, I have questions. I, uh, I don't trust the oil and gas industry, the people in the boardrooms, I don't trust them. What's it called? What's it called? Podcast. It's called the Clean Energy Show. I wore the hat, it wasn't cheap. <laughs> Uh, available where fine podcasts are found, and some bad ones. <laughs> so again, congratulations to the authors. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of the book. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, James. Uh, and Trish, actually, for your contribution and for the great comedy finale uh, for this event. As promised, uh, we're open it up for a Q&A, but before we get into that, I was wondering if perhaps we could give a round of applause for the staff here at Regina Brewing, who have been doing a great job. It's an incredible venue, wonderful staff, so thank you very much. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Charles Smith from the University of Saskatchewan is here. He was a, an exceptional contributor to the, to the book. He can talk about the police, the state, um, Sean Tucker, <laughs> Occupational Health and Safety, Emily Eden certainly can uh, dive deeper into the question of environmental justice. Trish is here as well. Are there any questions? questions or and, comments sorry, or comments. Kevin Skerritt, of course. Uh, pensions were pivotal and very important in this entire saga. Any questions from the audience? Or, yes. Comments disguised as questions. Yeah, yeah. masquerading as questions, <laughs> yes, comments. And it, I, what I'll do is I'll repeat the question into the microphone so everybody can hear it, uh, and then I'll bring up whoever wishes to answer. 
Just put up your hands if you have anything you want to ask. Okay, uh, I just have a question. Without tipping the hand of the executive or the bargaining committee, is are you looking to build support between now and 2026 to get back your pensions, get back pensions for younger workers that are excluded? Because that was the wedge. And I just want to know whether it's, it's going to be on the table for you. Would someone like to come up here and? Um, yeah, kind of, kind of, tr kind of tricky to give you a real good answer because, like you said, you know, don't want to tip the hand on anything. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Um, probably, probably starting almost before we ratified last time. Absolutely, we've got plans on pension improvements, um, and and to to continue having good pensions for for people in our industry, people at our local. Um, whether, whether we're talking DB or DC or what we're trying to work on and negotiate on, um, we'll, we'll see in a year or so. But yeah, we absolutely, that's, that's been at the forefront of you know, future planning, future negotiations, pretty much since we ratified. Definitely, pensions are still going to be top of our priorities. Before you leave the mic, could you... Explain what is a defined contribution versus a defined benefit. You use DC and DB, just really yeah. simply. Sorry, so the pension we had that, that closed now um, was a defined benefit. Um, so that's kind of where you pay in your entire career and you have an expected amount, regardless of markets, regardless of, of really what you've contributed over that time, um, you're, you're going to get a known amount paid out to you based on your years of service and the, the percent that it accrues at and, and your best 36 months for our pension um, of, uh, of earnings and that you'll get whatever percentage you've accrued of that pension and that's what you're getting. Um, where a defined contribution, benefit, ben, defined contribution pension um, is, is what we've got now, anyone new hire, um, since a couple negotiations ago is on, on this DC def defined contribution plan. Um, and that's a lot more at, at the whim of the markets. The liability on those pensions rather than on the employer is all on the person collecting that pension. Um, you can work for a lot of years contributing to a DC pension. And if you retire at the wrong time with the markets, you <laughs> the amount of money you have in your pension to collect can be bigger or smaller, um, and and you can outlive your pension. That's a that's a real, realistic possibility. Um, where with a defined benefit, that's not the concern. That's why we wanted to fight so hard to keep that DB pension. Um, it's it's a much more of a sure thing for the retiree. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, I was just saying that we, we know that um, there's been an announcement in the last number of years that the, um, the refinery wants to build, uh, well, they don't want to build the canola crushing, but they want to use crushed canola oil for, to create biofuels. So this is part of the transition to greener fuels. So I just wanted to get a sense from, from the union. Um, how do they see this process happening and are jobs going to be guaranteed? What, what kind of discussions have you had internally about making sure that people will continue to have jobs within the refinery? All right, um, thank you. I actually kind of intentionally sidestepped that bit <laughs> just because again, don't really want to want to tip the hand or or talk about what our expectations are. But yeah, this biodiesel complex, as far as we know, is still ongoing. Um, I debated talking about it because uh, Dan talked a little bit about our certification. Um, it, it's on our radar. We're, we're talking about it. I think our expectation as a local is that, yeah, of course, it's going to be a 594 site. It's if you read our cert, it talks about, you know, has to do with refining and, and blending of 
petroleum products within the city of Regina. This will be within the city of Regina. It will have tie-ins with some utilities in our plant. Um, our opinion, that's a 594 site. I'm willing to bet the employer has a pretty different opinion on that. Um, so yet to be seen, maybe a fight that we have to have. Um, but yeah, it's, it's on our radar. We talk about it a lot. Um, and, and we'll see what happens there, but. Would you like to come up or do you want me just to repeat it? Loud. All right. A uh, couple more pension questions. Uh, so to my understanding, the longer term employees did not lose the defined benefit pension plan and it was just putting new people on the contribution. Uh, is that correct? Well, that, was, that was in 2016. Okay. That happened. In 2019, there was a choice. Do the, do, the, do the pension folks want to come up here and answer that? I think. So that you say you will. Okay. Okay. Kevin, would you, would you folks like to come up here? <laughs> Great question. There's a lot of pension experts in the room. I'll answer, I'll answer some of that. So, uh, again, Kevin mentioned in 2016, the pension plan was closed to new hires. Uh, that was the only change. So, at, at, at that point in time, anyone who was still on it, uh, there was no more issues with it. They, they're still getting their years of service. Everything was fine. Nothing changed for them. In 2019, uh, when the lockout was over, that pension plan was closed. So individuals at that time were given the option. They could stay in the pension plan, but they would lose their indexing going forward. That's how that ultimately settled out. Um, or they had the option of moving to the DC plan, uh, transferring a commuted value over into a DC plan and going there. Now, as far as uh, the second part of your question, how are you gonna deal with that? Well, in theory, uh, the DB plan becomes cheaper and cheaper as there are fewer people still alive and in it. So the cost for that plan goes down. Uh, Kevin mentioned uh, earlier that uh, right now the, the refinery is on a, a contribution holiday. And they have been for over a year where they have not had to pay into the defined benefit plan because the interest, rate, interest rates are high enough. So for over a year, they've had to make no payments in and the pension plan is making enough money through interest rates to cover all future expenses. Whether that continues is going to depend on what the interest rates do. So. If the company is willing to just leave the thing alone, it will eventually die a death as, as, as uh, those members retire and, and move on. So that's, that's kind of what will happen to that. Uh, now, future negotiations, anything could happen. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Skerritt is a pension expert who has negotiated and dealt with this issue across different industries. Maybe he'd like to add something. So I, I will try to add just a quick word about uh, the question. I appreciate the question because it actually gets kind of right to the heart of the drama and intensity of this dispute over pensions. It was, as Dan, I think, really effectively and powerfully described, the 2019 lockout over pensions was in a lot of ways set up by the 2016-17 round that where the employer achieved this big gain that they wanted, which was closing the defined benefit plan to new hires. Uh, and I, you know, the, the chapter that I did in the book really describes in detail how that worked and sort of the, the trajectory of it. The point I would just add, and it's really in addition to the powerful messages we got from Dan and Kevin and Nathan, is just to say a quick word about like this as an employer tactic. This is obviously a vicious employer. It became that way, right? Okay, but one of the points I wanna make is, what do vicious employers they do? They learn from other vicious employers. And, and frankly, this model for achieving pension concessions was imported from other places. This is what, in fact, the big three automakers had started to do, uh, Inco in Sudbury, and I talk about these cases in the chapter, where they come aggressively to bargaining, and I, and I want to issue this as, like, we have to think about this. What are, they, what are the employers doing when they, when they do this? 
we, we, and we have to think from a trade union and you know, workers' perspective. What the employer is saying is, we want savings, we don't like the cost of this pension, and we've got a plan for how to achieve savings where all your existing members are safe. That's what they came in 2016, 17. Your pension will be protected and it'll only be new hires that will be affected. It puts a real challenge on the union and it did in this case, obviously, and other unions as well. Uh, and unfortunately, especially when there's weakness or aggression or, or whatever, unions have in multiple cases kind of been forced over a barrel and ended up in this situation with a two-tier result. Now let's just think through what, the, what does that mean? And this is what your question is getting to is, what that means is post 2017 settlement, every new hire is given an inferior pension. And the, and the defined benefit pension plan members are retiring off. So just as Dan just said, over a 20 year period or whatever the generation is, the defined benefit plan goes away and the liability and the risks and the costs associated are eliminated. So I guess I, I could go on about it, but I'll just say one thing about what trade unions are trying to do to grapple with this, because it is a source of weakness. We end up with members with two different categories of members, some on the good DB plan and some on the crappy defined contribution plan becomes a real source of weakness when you then have to try to go on strike to defend only the old hires and a large, you know, this is very divisive, right? So what I would just encourage us all to try to think about in the wake of this is how do we restore the kind of basic solidarity among union members so that when we're in collective bargaining, everyone wins equally, right? And, and I'll just say to, to, to conclude, like, like in a situation like this where you inherit a two-tier structure, we've got to think about how to get there. And, that, and you know, so we're doing this. I think different unions, Unifor, QP is a union that I worked for for many years. We're thinking about how to get back to like a single tier structure. So I'm happy to talk to Nathan and the existing local to, to think about models and examples where, where potentially a bargaining strategy could be drafted uh, that, that restores that you know, single tier pension. Great, thank you. Great questions and comments, folks. Um, anyone else? Fire away. Uh, I think this is more directed at you. So I work at Everest, and uh, you know, so I very much support my clients, but I also don't think it's a contradiction to say that we do need to do sort of benefit also do this. Um, you mentioned up there that you think that the workers that are fighting here are some of the most advocate for transitioning. I wonder if you talk about that, because I don't find that where I work. I find the people where I work very hesitant and not interested in Kevin, come on up. The other Kevin. Yeah, do you feel okay repeating it? Yeah. yeah, so his question was, he thinks, like, I think you misunderstood me. He, he is saying that the people at the refinery are looking at a transition. I would, I would agree with you that probably the refinery workers are the same as ever as workers. And my statement was more geared to they need to start looking at the future because just sticking your head in the sand and saying, I don't want to go there, isn't going to have your kids have a job in 20 years because the world is going there. Yeah. And there's enough of the population that is pushing to go there. So the companies are understanding that and the companies are actually transitioning, right? But they have every intent of leaving the workers behind at Everaz and at the refinery. So to sit there and say, no, it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, isn't gonna do anything for you. And we need to smarten up in how we talk to our members to say to them, it's okay to feel threatened about a transition, but we need to be talking about it or your kids may not have a job in the new society, in the new energy. And, and, and that is a problem and because it's really hard for union executives to draft that message 
because you're talking to those people that are loud, that may be on the convoy, right? It's very hard, but you have to somewhere figure out what that message is to them to say, it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. We're not trying to get rid of your job. What we're trying to do is make sure it's there for 100 years, not just 10. Thank you. And the only way that's gonna happen is if those workers are talking to the government. The government only listens to one thing, and that's getting reelected. If it affects their reelection, they'll listen. If it doesn't, and right now, it doesn't affect them, right? Because they know those workers are fighting for them, even though the government isn't fighting for them. Boo, elected officials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was getting some dirty looks over there. Great questions. Uh, Jim, go ahead, please. Come on up, Jim. Come on up. Sorry, 20 years ago, I could speak from the back of any union hall and be heard <laughs> at the front. But what I was going to say is it's important to remember that the kind of scabs we had here in Regina are illegal in Quebec yeah. and are illegal in BC. And I think will soon be illegal in anything under federal jurisdiction. <laughs> And my understanding is, is they will be illegal in Manitoba very soon. So there will be a number of people coming around knocking on our doors, asking to put up signs on our lawns like they've done many times before. And I think we need to make it clear to them that this is the new front in terms of people having the right to bargain collectively. We cannot have professional strike breakers coming in when workers are exercising their constitutional here, rights. Here. <laughs> Wonderful. I think there's an election coming up. <laughs> All right. Who else? Uh, I know we have other contributors to the book. Did they want to come up? And he he didn't drive from Saskatoon for nothing. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, Charles. <laughs> Charles. Blue Jays. Blue Jays. Talk about the Blue Jays. Okay. So long as you only have things to say about the provincial government, not the municipal one, we'll be okay. All right. Oh, well, thank you. Well, um, I I don't. Oh, my name's Charles Smith. I, I came from Saskatoon. Saskatoon got a kind of a bad rap in some of the comments tonight. So, so there were some bad raps in Saskatoon, so I didn't want to admit that, that we came down from Saskatoon. But this is my family. We came down uh, to, to tonight's launch. So we wrote a book, or a chapter, sorry, about um, the role of the, the courts and the police and um, the law in shaping the lockout uh, during the, the co-op lockout. And what, what, what shocked us was and you know, the comments tonight about how the, the company was so brutal and they treated us so badly, and that's obviously the case. Um, and some of the, the remedies that they were seeking, trying to throw you in jail, Kevin, for 600 years or something ridiculous, was, <laughs> spoke to that. Um, but the more, Lisa and I, Lisa is a grad student of mine, she's now a law student, and she's an incredible uh, gifted researcher. But one of the things that we, we were shocked by, it wasn't just the company against the union, it was the company, it was the police, it was the municipal government, it was the provincial government, it was the courts, it was the judges, and it was the lawyers against the union. That's what was so clear to us as we wrote it. There were 13 legal proceedings against Local 594 throughout that dispute, to, which went lasted beyond the strike, or the, co the lockout itself, which is just shocking to us, right? And the constitutional right to strike, it was so laughable in as much as the, the driver's exemption, right? Where a driver could say, we don't want to listen to your, what you have to say, let us through. Yeah. And the court said, yeah, that's constitutional. And we were just like, well, what's the point of a picket line at that point, yeah. right? So you see these institutions that work against the collective rights of workers to put up a picket line and say we are on, or we are locked out against this. Sorry, I kept calling it a strike, and I kept getting uh, yelled at by five nine four <laughs> members. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, we are on dispute against this company, and we can't even have the right to say that out loud. Um, not, not to mention the the arrests, the you know, quite frankly, the illegal and unconstitutional arrests uh, on that co on that picket line. So that was what our chapter was about. Uh, and we were really, you know, shocked by it. It is, a, it is a current example of how the state and the laws of this country work so much against the collective rights of workers. Uh, and so proud of 594 for waging that struggle uh, for all of us. So thank you. Thanks for having us. I just, 
I just want to add briefly to what Charles said there. I, I, I saw actually in a courtroom for one of the um, uh, proceedings that was brought on by the employer. And Kevin, you were the target for uh, one of that. that they, they, the employer was requesting jail time, is that correct? 100 days jail time in Canada in 2020. Yeah. Union leaders going, going to jail. And there was another uh, executive member of 594. Less, yeah. Less, yeah. And he had to stand in court and the judge looked at him. And that's how bad this got, is the employer was asking to jail union leaders in Canada in 2020. And, and that's, we got to change some of these things so we don't end up in this situation again. I guess I could put a last call out there for questions, but not yeah. drinks. Come on up, Cheryl. Okay. Come on up. Just another, you're last karaoke Just now. another question. I'm not sure if any, because I haven't read the book and Penny University doesn't have any more here. Anyway. Next um, week, next week. Next week. Um, I don't know if it's been touched upon, but so either the authors or the union. Um, I'm just wondering if um, the fact that this is a cooperative, started as a cooperative, and some of the worst and long-standing strikes we've had in this province have been with co-ops. So what, has anyone kind of tackled that question? Excellent question. <laughs> yeah, so we did. We tried. And Federated Co-op will fight you tooth and nail. So we managed to get two people on the Sherwood board, which is the Regina Co-op. And that's all we could have tackled. We tried to tackle Saskatoon. They literally flooded the meeting with 1,200 people to make sure that our candidates didn't get elected. They told their managers to make it to those meetings and told them who to vote for in Saskatoon. So that's what you're up against. The other problem is to get a seat on the board of Federated Co-op, you need to try to infiltrate seven or eight different zones just to get that seat. So it's damn near impossible. And they've handpicked their people to sit on every one of those boards. It, so we had initially tried to get a chapter specific to the to the co-op question. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. But that's a million dollar question. I think is really important. This is still ostensibly a co-op. Uh, Let's close it. All right. I, I've been told to wrap it up. So I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, it really means a lot. Good to you. Uh, again, thank you very much to the staff here for doing an incredible job of putting up with us for the evening. I'm told we have it until 10 o'clock tonight, so we're, we're paid up for another 45 minutes. You're not forced to leave. We can have a conversation. Thank you very much, uh, and there will be more books at some point. Have a great evening. Thank you.